Hi everyone, my name is Scott Bono and welcome to the channel. Hey, Scott from the future here. As I was editing the video, I realized that the entire intro was blurry, so let's try this again. Hi everybody, my name is Scott Bono and welcome to the channel. On today's video, we are recreating Nutshell by Alice in Chains. Let's get into it. Nutshell is the second track on the Jar of Flies EP, which was recorded in a seven day period in late 1993 at London Bridge Studio in Seattle and released in early 1994. Nutshell is a favorite of many diehard Alice in Chains fans, despite never having been released as a single. It's sort of a window into Lane Staley's tortured soul. It's just haunting and beautiful and just a wonderful composition. Today I'm going to break down five elements that I think make Nutshell work so well, and we're going to start with number five, the dynamics and the feel. If you're not familiar, dynamics in music refer to the change in volume and tempo that occur over the course of the song. The more variation there is in volume and tempo, the higher the dynamics. And dynamics play a big part in the overall feel of the song. Nutshell has great dynamics, especially with the tempo. This song was definitely not recorded to a metronome or a click. It increases in tempo by about 30 BPM from the beginning to the end of the song. The tempo changes create a sense of building intensity throughout the song, which starts out slow and methodical with just a single acoustic guitar, and ultimately builds and erupts with a really killer guitar solo before fading out into nothing. The movement in the tempo, while organic, feels very intentional, and it drives the emotional arc of the song. It works hand in hand with thing number four that I think makes Nutshell work so well, and that is the arrangement. The arrangement for Nutshell is simple and beautiful. It starts with a single acoustic guitar playing a simple and unchanging four chord pattern. After about 20 seconds, the bass comes in with a sad and lonely melancholy bass line, and it's almost a full minute into the song before the drums and vocals kick in. The arrangement together with the steadily increasing tempo throughout the song create this atmosphere of contemplativeness and haunting melancholy and ultimately a very patient feel. As an aside, there's no way a song like this would be on a major label record these days, ironically for a bunch of the reasons that I think make it work so well. All right, back to the arrangement. There are only two short vocal verses and no chorus. There's just some ooze over a little guitar interlude. And there aren't even any chord changes in the song. It's just the same four chords throughout the entire song with some minor variations in voicing and some variation in the bass line. The closest thing to a bridge in the song is a spot towards the end of the second verse where the guitar and the bass drop out, leaving just the vocals to hang over that simple, haunting drum beat. So basically all of the movement in the song comes from the arrangement and the dynamics. It's just really simple and beautiful. This brings us to thing number three that I think makes Nutshell work so well, and that is the reverb. The original version of this song is absolutely a wash in reverb. It was engineered and mixed by Toby Wright, who did a really great job of making a really big and powerful song from some very simple musical ingredients. And one of the ways that he did that is with the reverb. To my ear, it sounds like every single element of the mix is routed through the reverb in some way or another. And the effect is this big open sound that's simultaneously huge, but also haunting and lonely. What it reminds me of is playing music in a big empty hall. You get this huge, boomy, wide open sound, but that same sense of loneliness and sadness. It just really adds to the overall dynamics and feel of the song. It's almost like because there's so little going on musically in the song, the reverb just enhances that sense of loneliness and foreboding. It's just, it's great. And this takes us to thing number two that I think makes Nutshell work so well, and that is the acoustic guitar and acoustic bass tones. The primary guitar and bass tones on the entire Jar of Flies record were plugged in acoustic guitars and acoustic basses, which really makes Jar of Flies a unique record. The challenge with plugged in acoustic guitars is they produce a much thinner and tinnier sound than if you just put a microphone in front of the guitar. You can get away with that in a live setting, and companies like Ovation actually made acoustic guitars that were designed specifically to be played live and plugged in, but it's fairly uncommon to see them used that way in a studio setting, especially as the primary tone. But somehow that plugged in acoustic guitar became the tonal foundation for basically the entire Jar of Flies record, maybe most pronounced on Nutshell and Rotten Apple, which is the first track on Jar of Flies. Part of the reason that I think this works is that Mike Inez, the bass player, also chose to use a plugged in acoustic 
acoustic bass for all the bass tones as well. A plugged in acoustic bass is even more uncommon in a studio setting than a plugged in acoustic guitar, but for some reason, these two things together just worked extremely well and it creates a fantastic, unique sound to the entire album. And one of the reasons that I called out the reverb as being one of the key things that makes Nutshell work so well is that I think it really helps to fill in some of the sonic holes that you get that are inherent with a plugged in acoustic guitar and an acoustic bass. And that brings us to the number one thing that I think makes Nutshell work so well, and that is the guitar solo. I love literally everything about the guitar solo in this song. The tone is gnarly and distorted, but still it sits perfectly in the middle of this delicate acoustic song. The interludes after the verses are fragile and haunting and perfect. And lastly, the guitar solo itself is just brilliant. And just like the rest of the song, the guitar solo is very patient. It starts out slow, builds, it eventually erupts with two fast ascending and descending runs, and then it fades away on this gigantic melancholy bend. I've wanted to record a version of this song for years, but I've just never been able to play those last two runs in the solo, and the perfectionist in me just wouldn't let me record the song if I wasn't gonna be able to get those note for note perfect. Well, I think I finally got it. Here's my take on the Nutshell solo. I feel better dead. Okay, so now we've broken down the song and we've discovered the five things that make it work so well. So now we have to put it back together. Let's walk through what I did to create my album faithful version of the song. Let's start with the tempo. In the original, the tempo builds from about 110 BPM and ultimately ends up over 130 BPM. And it wasn't recorded to a click, so all of that movement is organic. Since I'm recording digitally, I have to use a tempo map to try to recreate that same feel. Let's take a quick look. So you can see the tempo map here. I did start out at 120 BPM. When the bass picks up, it hits at about 126 BPM. And then there's actually a fairly steep rise just as the drums come in right before the beginning of the first verse. It gets to about 132 there and stays there throughout most of the song in, in my version. There's a little bit more movement in the original. And then lastly, there is one further move. I think it's up to 136 BPM, um, which is right after the second verse as we pick up into the guitar solo. All right, let's talk a little bit about the reverb really quickly. The reverb on this one was a tough nut to crack, but I think I finally found something that works pretty well. Ultimately, on Nutshell, I did something I don't usually do on my mixes. I used a single reverb channel for the entire mix, and I routed each of the individual musical subgroups into that one reverb channel. Then I blended the levels based on the sends just to try to find a mix that worked. To get the reverb tone that I was looking for, I used the great and free super massive plugin from Valhalla. It really gave me exactly what I was looking for. Let's take a listen. To give you a sense for the reverb, I'm gonna play the first breakdown in the song, which has those vocal ooze over the acoustic guitar, the bass, the drums, and the guitar interludes. And then afterwards, I'll solo the reverb so that you can hear just that. that reverb tail there at the end. I'm gonna solo just the reverb channel um, real quickly as we go through that same section so you can hear it.
verb by itself doesn't really sound all that interesting, but you can hear the vocals really swimming in there. You can hear a little bit of the acoustic guitar and you can even hear a little bit of the electric guitar in there as well. Lastly, for comparison, I'm gonna play through that same section, but I'm gonna mute the reverb track so you can hear what it sounds like both with and without. Here it is without. See the, the difference there. It definitely fills up the space. It's a little bit dry without it. Adds to the overall ambience and feel of the song. For the acoustic guitar, I recorded two takes playing as identically as I could. But rather than panning one out left and one out right as you might under other circumstances, I used one dead up the middle as the primary sound for the song. And then with the second, I kind of buried it in the mix a little bit, especially at the beginning of the song. And then as the song builds, I use automation to bring up the volume and the contribution of that second guitar into things like the chorus and reverb and some spatial widening plugins just to increase the thickness and the overall feel of the acoustic guitar as the song itself builds in intensity. Here you can see the acoustic guitars. The main acoustic is this one right here. The double is here and you can see the automation where this starts out pretty low at minus 23 dB. It starts to build as the bass picks up and then finally kicks up again as the solo kicks in. And then you can also see that the acoustic chorus channel that I have on here also increases right around the time that the first verse kicks in. So the overall sound of the acoustic guitar builds throughout the song. Here's a little bit of those acoustic guitars soloed so that you can get a sense for what it sounds like as the second guitar starts to build up. So definitely much more full by the end of that little section. And let's just play that one more time with the rest of the mix there so you can sort of hear that in context. So that acoustic guitar that starts out very simple and very minimal starts to build and by the time the bass kicks in, you need a little bit more body and that second guitar increasing in volume through the automation provides that to complement what's happening with the bass. For the bass sound, I played a Fender Kingman acoustic bass plugged directly into the Hi-Z input on my audio interface. I then ran it through the Line 6 Helix plugin using a fairly simple patch that had an Ampeg SVT model. One of the most pronounced parts of the bass tone on Nutshell in particular, but really all of Jar of Flies, is a very noticeable chorus effect. To achieve this, I used the stock Logic chorus plugin and just played around with the sound until I got something that was pretty close to what was on the record. Let's take a listen. Here's the dry bass soloed. Not a super compelling sound by itself, that's for sure. So to beef that up, I did a couple of things here. One was, as I said before, ran through the Helix plugin with that Ampeg SVT model. I also ran a second copy of the bass through another Helix Ampeg SVT model, but this one I ran through an Empirical Labs distressor and it's set to crush. So basically just a ton of compression on there and I blend that in for texture. This is what all three of those bass sounds sound like together before the processing. So even just that, it's obvious that there's a big improvement from just the dry bass. And then on top of that, we did a little bit more work too. So we used some EQ, some compression, and ultimately used Vitamin, which is a sonic enhancer plugin from Waves. And it really finishes off the tone. So here is what it sounds like with all the processing in. Here's without that chorus, just for comparison. No chorus. Chorus in. So 
So yeah, even just the stock logic chorus plugin there really completes the tone. Sounds great. You can see the settings that I used here. And lastly, onto the electric guitar tone for the interludes and the solo. It took some work to get the tone that I was looking for here, but I'm pretty happy with how it came out. I played my Gibson Les Paul Studio, which again, I recorded dry directly into the high Z input of my audio interface. I then reamped the dry performance out through a pretty simple signal chain, just a preamp pedal, the Revival Drive by Origin Effects, and then into the Moore Radar, which is a power amp and cabinet simulator pedal. The Revival Drive is a preamp pedal that has two distinct circuits in it, one that's based on a tube or valve style circuit and the other based on a silicon or solid state. To get the final guitar tone, I actually ran twice through the Revival Drive, one through each preamp circuit, and then I actually ran each of those out through three different cabinet simulators in the Moore Radar. One cabinet was a 4x10 basement style cab, one a 4x12 Marshall style cab, and one was a 2x12 Vox style cab. The main tone on the final track was the valve side of the preamp with the 412 Marshall, with a secondary tone being the silicon side of the preamp with a 412 Marshall. The other four tones I just blended in for texture and for some stereo space. And that's it. We've now broken down and recreated Nutshell by Alice in Chains. I had a blast working on this song and breaking it down for all of you, so I hope you enjoyed it as well. You can hear the final product at soundcloud.com slash scottbono. There'll be a link in the description. I want to give a huge thank to my friend Eric Herbinson who played the drums on this song, so thanks very much, Eric. And thank you all for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Bye.